Hello, my name's Dr. Amanda Lee. I've met you before in um, the quantitative data analysis and research methods. So um, lovely to um, virtually meet you again. This lecture today is about epidemiology and it's for the local and global health unit, which is run with Manchester Metropolitan University for the pre-registration master's nursing programme. So epidemiology is the scientific study and the analysis of patterns and distributions and the determinants of health. We've talked about a few determinants, social determinants and um, physiological determinants of health. But what epidemiology looks at is a, a scientific manner to be able to look at distributions, patterns, determinants of health and disease conditions in defined populations. And what we look at in epidemiology is how we can study how we can control diseases and how we can prevent diseases across populations. So it's absolutely relevant to nursing. What we're trying to do with epidemiology is to identify risks of disease, to look at preventative medicine and measures to be able to target those diseases or those outbreaks. Many, many years ago, John Snow um, predicted the outbreaks of cholera across London. So we consider him as our founder of epidemiology. I'm here to give you today's lecture because I drew from epidemiology with my PhD studies and I use cancer statistics to um, present a geographical information software to be able to identify areas of need for healthcare intervention. It was a really cool study and what it meant was that I was able to use data to draw maps and draw from Office for National Statistics demographic data sets and layer those on top of um, mapped data and also layer them on top of um, incidents of the gastroesophageal cancer which, um, which was in and around the area. So what I did as an epidemiologist was to define that geographical area define the patient population, identify the disease and target what was going on with the disease, identify risk factors and preventative measures that, that are present and around the communities, and then develop mapped representations of hotspots. It's a great application of one of the methodologies that we have in epidemiology. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, it's a cool subject. Um, it, it's really, really important to nursing because if we don't know where our patients are, if we don't know what disease profiles our patients have got, how can we predict what we need for the future? So as we've said in the previous slide, epidemiology is the study of how often diseases occur in different groups of people, but also why they occur in different groups of people. Epidemiological information so information about who it is, what it is and why it is and where it is, that information is then used to plan and evaluate the strategies that we can implement to prevent illness and also to offer as a guide to how we can manage patients in certain disease profiles. So it's really, really important. We try to look at what populations are at risk and what different types of ways that we can mitigate those risks. And that's basically what epidemiology is. Why is that important as a nurse? It's exceptionally important to you as a nurse because if you don't know where your patients are, you don't know what disease profiles that you can predict, how can you plan your healthcare interventions? This session is going to talk to you a little bit more about what it is, why it's important, and I'm going to introduce you to some key concepts as well. Some of the ways that we use to define populations or define parameters within given populations. And with that, I'm going to talk to you about different methods that we apply as well and how we can look at demographic data. And demographic data is collecting a collection of information about certain populations. So it might be an age profile. It might be a disease profile. It might be gender or, or um, ethnic minority profiling. It could be a number of different ways. Um, and the methodologies and how we sort of define what we're doing is really important to understanding our populations at risk. 
and the population at risk is all that group of people, either healthy or sick, who could be counted as cases if they had a disease which was under study. Epidemiology also gives, gives us some really great opportunities to look at outbreaks and look at causes of outbreaks. Because if you think back to COVID and what happened there many years ago, a couple of years ago, the World Health Organization helped us to identify a disease profile, looked at the outbreak, started giving us definitions from being a, an epidemic to a pandemic, and gave us some of the reasons and the causations and how diseases spread. And this is fundamental to how we deliver healthcare in the future as nurses. One key feature of epidemiology is how we look at disease outcomes and we use the population at risk as a measure, as the denominator for that population at risk. And it can be a group of people, it can be healthy people, sick people, people at risk, for example. So, for example, if you wanted to study gastroesophageal cancer or throat cancer, for example, we can look at the profile of that disease and we know that it affects more people who are male over the age of 60. So already we can look at population profiles and think, right, how many people in that population are males over 60? Because they're going to be affected disproportionately when compared to other populations. So already we've defined our denominator, we've defined that population at risk. We know that there are other populations at risk, but if we really want to measure something that we're going to implement to be able to prevent late diagnosis, for example, we might choose to target that elderly population over 60 who are males. We might choose strategies which would do that. But what we need to do then is once we've done that implementation of something to prevent, we might choose to start thinking, right, how do we measure that? How do we value the effectiveness of anything that we've put forwards? And epidemiology gives us beautiful methodology to be able to do that. So we've recorded our population at risk. We've identified the contributing factors. And now we're going to implement something and we can evaluate how effective that is. So basically, epidemiology is really, really does need the distribution of the disease. Who does it affect, where and at most? We can look at the health status across communities and groups. So, for example, we know that certain nutritional diseases happen more readily in people of lower socioeconomic groups in certain countries because those people don't have access to decent basic nutrition and food. We can also look at the natural history of disease within populations. So taking my gastroesophageal cancer, for example, as an example, where we know that within the population, within the wider population, we know that that's going to affect more elderly males. We can also look at risk factors for disease or outbreak. So let's think about risk factors for lung cancer, for example. We might choose to target smokers. We might choose to target people who have... Um, access to pollutants or problems within the communities and the environments. So epidemiology can draw from all of those data, amalgamate them to make a meaningful, measurable, determinable healthcare intervention strategy. So epidemiology doesn't just necessarily look at populations at risk, it can also bring in things like, you know, for example, if we think about malaria, we know where the mosquitoes are that spread malaria. We can identify geographical areas where those are higher incidence. And that means we can start to look at environmental factors that might affect malaria outbreaks within communities. So what that gives you an example of one of the main aims of epidemiology, and that's to discover the agent. So the thing that's happening that's going to cause a problem or the host, the person who's going to get the problem, or any environmental factors. For example, the presence of mosquitoes or the presence of um, pollutants or air quality that, that's really terrible. 
Epidemiology also tries to ha define health status of communities across the groups as well. So this is where we use surveillance mechanisms. We can draw from Office for National Statistics data um, and that gives us profiles of populations. We can draw from um, World Health, Health Organization information on, um, on the environmental factors that are associated with different places. So all this gives us sort of information and data to be able to offer surveillance. We can also use disease incidences. So for example, Cancer Research UK published profiles of how many people get certain cancers across the UK. Similarly, the World Health Organization collect this on a worldwide level. So we know we can compare either country by country, region by region, or world areas by world areas so you know it's it's a really interesting concept but you have to define those communities to start off the other thing that epidemiology tries to do is look at that sort of causation of illness and disability or death and what it does is it studies the natural history of that disease profile and how diseases are progressed or transmitted or spread for example so let's take covid for example we knew that it started in some small areas, that there were outbreaks in certain places, and we know that by looking at the spread of that disease, identifying hosts of that disease, and how that was spread and how that was transmitted, we could really then start to limit where we needed to be and to, to, to put in preventative measures to be able to contain the virus. The other thing epidemiology does as well is look at risk factors that increase the chances of somebody contracting a disease. So let's take cardiovascular health, for example, cardiovascular diseases. We know that certain risk factors, smoking, lifestyle risk factors, may well exacerbate a disease or may well cause mortality across the disease. And epidemiology just offers a methodology to be able to collate that information, collate that data and evidence to be able to identify, yes, this population is more at risk. Now, once you've identified that patient's at risk and there's a big population there that is at risk, you wanted to put in a healthcare intervention. How do we know that that healthcare intervention is efficacious or is working for those populations? Epidemiology, yet again, gives you a beautiful methodology to evaluate how effective those healthcare interventions are. And this is really important because when governments are putting money into the pot to help us to control diseases or to manage outbreaks or viruses, we need to know that our policies are effective and workable and appropriate, cost effective, time effective, and they're going to work. So what epidemiology gives us are methods to be able to define populations, define interventions, evaluate interventions and understand more of what's going on in our communities. So public health is an umbrella term that encompasses various professions and there is one profession, um, public health epidemiology. But public health offers this umbrella term um, and it captures a number of organisations who are all set on priorities to improve health uh, across, um, across communities and um, countries and continents. Epidemiology, as we've talked about, studies occurrence, spread, treatment of diseases through different sorts of research and rigorous quantitative analysis. But what public health is about is the strategies. How do we manage those sorts of strategies? How do we implement and evaluate what's going on? So public health practitioners, for example, let's look at Public Health England, they set priorities and their priorities will be informed by epidemiology. Now Public Health England strategy to, has, it, is really, really sort of focused on things like diagnostic testing, healthcare surveillance, leading lots of multi-agent teams to be able to implement preventative control or outbreak response. They look at collating information from evidence basis to be able to give us the best ways of testing, interventions, contact tracing and all that sort of thing. They also look at research and evidence development. So what Public Health England would do, for example, would be to 
um, fund a number of um, research which would be undertaken by epidemiologists to understand disease profiles a little bit more. Now, public health also pull for all that information together and they offer advice and support for which types of healthcare and services we are going to deliver. They support things like vaccination programmes and how we roll those out. Public health offers scientific exam advice to governments, non-profit organisations and evidence-based communications about behaviour changes which are then available to the public. So have a look around at Public Health England, for example, or the World Health Organization. And these places are public health departments who are responsible for collating information from epidemiological studies or different areas of studies to identify best practice solutions to help communities in the best way possible. So descriptive epidemiology describes the what, who, where, when and why of a situation. What we try and do sometimes with epidemiology is look at how we can characterise an event or that healthcare event. And how we do that is we start trying to compile and analyse data by amalgamating time, place and person. By collating a load of information and data, we can start to look at different variables, the limitations of those variables, what's missing. We can start to look at patterning of the problem or the disease profiles. And we can start to evaluate and offer a detailed description of what's going on in that population. We also can identify areas or groups where there might be high rates of disease or lower rates of disease. And by comparing and contrasting, then that's really important because it reveals patterns. Now, time is really important because disease can change over time. So, for example, winter influenza, we know happens during the colder months. And what we can do is look at the incidences of disease and we can identify the months by which those diseases are more common. It might a season, seasonal sort of approach there with influenza, but there might well be some long term trends as well. So, for example, you might notice incidents of tuberculosis, which is which was almost eradicated in the UK and it's now slowly on the rise again. So that pattern, that trend offers some intelligence and some data intelligence based on time profiling. Now, the other thing that we look at as well is place. And why do we look at place? That's because it in, gives us insight into the geographical extent of the problem. So we know that certain diseases only happen in certain places at the moment. And let's look at Ebola outbreaks in some of the African states and cities. The Ebola virus is, is very, very limited by the fact that it causes, it spreads quickly, but it causes death almost immediately. Now, if it was a more insidious onset and we didn't recognise signs and symptoms as readily as we did, then perhaps the host or the person with the Ebola virus, Ebola virus might well have the chance to be able to spread it a lot more. So by knowing what the disease is, how it's spread, understanding the place where it occurs, we can then target solutions to be able to stop it. So place is really, really important as well. And one of the reasons why we look at place as well is so we can spot data on maps. And this is really important. And you can see that we've got um, on, on the left hand side, we can identify certain disease profiles which are more prevalent in certain areas across. Um, I think that's the NHS Wirral um, area there that you've got on this slide. Now, when we are talking about person, so we've talked about time, why that's important, why place is important. And now we've got to talk about persons. And this is because personal characteristics might well affect illness or how we react to the illness. Um, it also might talk about the organisations as well. So age, sex, race, biological characteristics, acquired characteristics like marital status, occupation, leisurely activities, use of tobacco, drugs. All these person characteristics 
can impact how a person reacts to a disease profile or is more prevalent where a disease profile is more present. So what we try and do in epidemiological studies is collate all this data, analyse the populations, look at behaviours across the populations and review all the environments that might well be exacerbating anything that's going on. We also count healthcare events as well. How many people in this area have this cancer? How many people in this area are smokers or drinkers or take alcohol or have limited access to health care. You can also look at measures of well-being as well. How many people in that area have good lifestyles that are outdoors and community driven? Um, and what we can do then is with all these data, we can put them all together and look to see whether or not there are relationships and offer potential cause and effect. So as we've said, public health is this overarching um, umbrella term and what public health does is it's there for prevention and surveillance. But what public health needs are informatics, lab studies, data, information, epidemiological methodology, which inform their practice. And public health informatics is that term. What's the informatics, what's the information that public health can use to make their populations more healthy or less at risk of a disease? So there are a number of key terms across methodologies in epidemiology. Um, epidemiology is associated with distribution. And what distribution means is what's the frequency and pattern of any health events across a population. So frequently is about how many health events are happening, but also what relationships does that have to the number and the size of population that it's serving. And that gives us a rate to be able to evaluate disease occurrence across population profiles. Now, distribution also pulls off the pattern as well. So what that means is how many health related events are happening between time, place and person. And we've already talked about time, place and person and why that's absolutely important. So patterning is to look at that geographical, um, geographical occurrence or temporal occurrence. You know, what's going on, how, what patterns are there around? Distribution is about the who, where, when, the time, the place, the person. Now, determinants are the sort of the causes now. So what factors influence why the disease is occurring? What health related events actually cause problems with why the disease has occurred? What we assume in epidemiology is that illness doesn't occur randomly in a population, but it happens when there's a lot of risk factors or determinants all exist in an individual and cause disease, damage or problem. So what that means is it can inform effective health control and it can inform effective prevention mechanisms because then that way we've defined what's going on. We've defined what intrinsic factors like genetics or biological factors that might actually cause a disease. What extrinsic factors might cause the disease, for example, high pollution rates or social factors or economic factors or physiological concerns like aging populations or what lifestyle choices make are a determinant of health and health mm. status. So it's about all of that. What's, what's going on? It's about the why and the what. What's happening and how can we start to form patterns to inform our practice? So some more key terms in epidemiology, health related states or events. Um, this can be a disease or it can be behaviours or it can be number of deaths or births, environmental factors, levels of happiness, records of injuries or violence or anything else. But basically it's whatever relates to the well-being of a population. And what that means is that's that's considered a health related state or event. And then we need to start thinking about the specified populations. Now, epidemiologists 
are concerned about the collective health of people in a community or a population. So as a nurse, your patient is an individual. As an epidemiologist, our patient is actually that community and understanding that community and the problems or the specific features of that community. So to define that community, we use terms like the geography of the community or the age profile or the gender or the ethnicity profile of that specified population. And then we look at applications as well. Epidemiology isn't just about study of health in a population. It's also about healthcare interventions and applications and understanding scientific methods and analytic methods to be able to evaluate anything that we do use to diagnose health status or to implement a strategy to be able to affect health status across a community. So just to recap, an epidemiologist's patient is a community, not just an individual. So this slide really just recaps it. So basically, we're trying to collect a load of data on a disease or healthcare profile. We're going to try and collect it all in manageable pieces and determine patterns and analyse and evaluate what might happen. But we're also trying to evaluate any outcomes from interventions as well. Or detect any occurrences of diseases across a given population. That is basically how epidemiologists look at a distribution of a disease. I absolutely, absolutely recommend that you double click on these hyperlinks. Um, Science in Five is a great podcast and it just identifies how epidemiologists use um, discussions on topics like you know, aviation, flu, dementia, what, what we're doing. And it's a really beautiful little podcast just to listen to, you know, when you've got a spare five minutes. Global Health Matters is also is a really, really important um, podcast evidence-based they talk about gender equality leaderships lots of disparities in health and all this is really really essential because when you're presenting your any of your lectures and you're presenting any of your assessments we need that crucial critical analysis now science in five and global health matters can offer you some really good insight to really capture that critical analysis that we need you to offer at master's level study So epidemiologists, like we say, are identifying the distribution of disease. Epidemiology is the scientific, systematic, data-driven analysis of frequencies and patterns of causes and risk factors of health-related states and events. Not just diseases, but health-related states and events. So one great example is Oppenshaw. He was uh, an epidemiologist, geographer, who applied geographical information science and he identified clusters of childhood leukaemia in and around certain areas in northern UK. We can look at some uh, case studies, for example, one of the most recent being the COVID-19 outbreak which informed the World Health Organization to develop a pandemic response. Nowadays, it's MPOX and how we look at clusters that are happening around there. One thing that Oppenshaw's geographical information system clustering methodology drew from was just down on this slide here, you can see a geographical analysis machine where you draw concentric circles around incidents. So each patient becomes a pinpoint on a map. Each pinpoint is overlaid to identify particular clusters that might well be happening. And this is really important. So for example, if you are looking at MPOX, you start to put those pins and pinpoint on a map the amount of people who are who are um, who are who are diagnosed with MPOX and you can identify clusters and with that cluster identification you can offer preventative me measures to be able to reduce spread. And here's one of the original case studies of epidemiology. Now John Snow in the 1850s 
was around, he was a physician and he was a specialist medical hygienist as well. Um, many years ago, there were big cholera and bubonic plague outbreaks and it was originally thought to be uh, bad air um, and problems associated with air, which is why you saw all these people with the cholera with the big masks on. Now, what Jon Snow did was to do the first ever epidemiological study and he posited the idea that cholera might well be spread by some other means, not necessarily just around the air or bad air. So what he did was he started looking at outbreaks. He started pinpointing on maps to see where people were traced, how people who contracted the cholera had been drawing water and everything else. He amalgamated a load of data to make assumptions. And what he did with all of those assumptions, by collating all that information and evidence, he drew patterns and understood what was going on. He identified, he mapped out all the cases of cholera in a particular outbreak and identified where each infected families had obtained their water sources from. Snow's findings identified one particular contaminated hand pump in Broad Street in London. And what he did there was he demonstrated that desserts occurred more frequently in customers of one water company. He identified cholera deaths were linked to a particular pump in London. And therefore, John Snow, our original epidemiologist, prevented significant further outbreaks of the disease. Likewise, Semmelweis, the saviour of mothers, another physician epidemiologist in the 1800s. And he developed an epidemiological approach to identify clustering of diseases across a maternity hospital. So in the 1800s, when difficult deliveries for women um, were commonplace and we didn't have the surgical interventions that we do nowadays. Many, many pregnant women had to undergo long, lengthy delivery processes. And adjunct to that meant many, many pregnant women got a lot of infections during childbirth. Purple fever occurs when bacteria infect the uterus and the surrounding areas of the female pelvis. Now, it was really common in mother and newborn babies many, many years ago because of the prolonged labour and problems with birth. There were significant epidemics in 1600s um, with severe mortality rates, up to 35% in some women. Um, absolutely dreadful. But we had Semmelweis and he offers a methodology to be able to help us to sort this out in the 1800s. So in many ways, Semmelweis offered an epidemiological intervention study. He had a hospital and he had two wards and he noticed the first ward that was run by doctors and students had a significantly higher rate of peripheral fever than the second clinic that was run by midwives. He started asking why that was. He started noticing that mothers in the doctors and students clinic with the 16% rates became ill immediately after giving birth or really, really close to delivery and who soon really died of rapidly developing fever. He also noticed that women giving birth at home had much lower incidence of childbed fever or purple fever. Why was this? And here's where you start to look at infection rates and what might be going on. So he knew that this was a case and he identified that perhaps there were contributing factors. And here, now you're all epidemiologists and you're following me around with the Semmelweis' um, approach, his epidemiological approach to childbed fever or purple fever. We can now start to plot the incidence and you can plot the information that's going on. So the first ward 
you can see what's happening with the deaths. In the second ward, you can see how the deaths are reduced. That's the midwifery second ward and the first ward being the medics and students. So what we're doing is, as an epidemiologist now, we're plotting data. We're collating and forming patterns to identify what's going on. And basically saying, what do you think the mortality rate in the ward first was higher than the second ward? And what do doctors and midwives do when they're actually looking to see how women are progressing through labour? We do an internal examination. And the problem there is that there's a potential for germ transmission by pelvic examinations. What Semmelweis identified was that medical students came directly from the death houses, often after performing autopsies, and they'd go straight into the pelvic examinations on the women who were just about to give birth. and therefore spread the infections from there. You have to remember back to the 1800s when we didn't necessarily have the infection control of the hand washing techniques. So what was happening? What Semmelweis identified was happening was there's an infection going on more readily in the medics and students ward. Why was that infection occurring? And he traced it back. He traced back by looking at what the medical students were doing day by day and understood what was going on. So epidemiology through clinical observation, controlled experimental interventions and data analysis could identify patterns and understanding of what was going on. The one difference between midwives and medics is that midwives weren't doing the autopsies before coming in to the wards to be able to deliver the babies. And that was the crucial factor. That was the crucial difference between Ward 1 and Ward 2. So epidemiology, detected patterns, understood what was going on and offered an evidence-based implementation guide to reduce infections from per purple fever. And here is where we start to think, right, so what would you do? What happens next? What things can you implement? And then how would you measure the efficacy of that implementation? Basic things that we can do. We need to know whether they'll work or not. And this is the other branch of epidemiology, the intervention evaluations. Of course, we all know nowadays the solution is hand washing. And Semmelweis felt that this was an absolute requirement. He identified that washing with antiseptic solution, that that would reduce the potential for childbed fever. And this was really important. However, as we've talked about before in some of the research methodology that I always talk about, Research is no good without dem dissemination. Dissemination is only good when you've got uptake of the advice that you're giving. Now, Semmelweis said doctors must wash their hands. But the whole community of doctors said, no, doctors are gentlemen. Gentlemen's hands are clean. Poor Semmelweis received such scorn and ridicule. He ended up moving away from Vienna and was actually committed to a mental asylum. Only nowadays, with the affirmation of germ theory, can we accept that hand washing is a thing. And that didn't come for years and years and years after his death, when Louis Pasteur identified the germ theory. OK, so I hope you enjoyed that. I mean, it really does show, doesn't it, that despite deaths over years and people really, really knowing what they were talking about and epidemiologists um, understanding some of the cause and effect, it's not necessarily always uptaken. Communities don't always respond in the way that you'd hope that they would. 
So let's move on now to natural history of disease. And this is something else that epidemiologists actually do try to study. The reason why we have to do that is because we need to know how disease pro pro progress um, in individuals or in communities over time, either with treatment or without treatment. The natural history of a disease is about the progression of a disease process in an individual over time in the absence of treatment. So for example, in Ebola virus or Lassa fever, Mpox, what we're looking at when we're studying those diseases is we look at the stage of susceptibility. What exposures has, have occurred to warrant that disease being spread? What types of subclinical disease stages are there? And what pathological changes there may be. And this is really important to onset of symptoms. So if it was Ebola, for example, we know exposure to onset of symptoms is very, very rapid, which is helpful in some ways because it means that Ebola doesn't spread as readily. Whereas more latent disease profiles with a slow onset of symptoms, the host could be spreading the disease for many, many months before the symptoms are onset and shown. The other thing that's really important is onset of symptoms to usual time of diagnosis. Take Mpox, for example. We know that from onset of symptoms, from pathological changes to time of diagnosis, there is a window of opportunity for other people to end up with the spread of disease. And then we start to look at what stages of clinical disease there may well be and how long it takes to recover or become disabled or to die with the disease. And all of these are really, really important because what they're doing is they're giving us some really important bits about how we collect data, why we need to collect data, how we can screen people and how we can intervene at the right points to be able to prevent spread. So here's a note on medical ethics. The first thing that we have to do as nurses and clinicians is to do no harm. We all take an oath to ensure that we offer to do no harm to any of our patients. Now, this is one of the abysmal studies that we've detected in epidemiology. There's a number of African-American gentlemen in Alabama who were untreated for syphilis so that the US government could evaluate degree, disease progression in syphilis. And here's where we understand the principles of biomedical ethics nowadays. This study, the Tuskegee, Alabama study, was a case control study. People had black males, 412 of them had syphilis and 202 had no syphilis. Not one of them were informed about the true nature of the study. So, first of all, we talk about beneficence, doing good, only doing good to your subjects in an uh, experiment. Non-malevolence, do no harm. To do no harm. Now, no one of these patients were treated at all, even after they knew that penicillin was introduced in 1940s, where syphilis could have been treated. Not one of the gentlemen with syphilis was treated. So non-malevolence, principle of biomedical ethics, absolutely not supported or upheld. Nobody was informed about the true nature of the study either. And here's where we talk another principle of biomedical ethics, informed consent, consent to undertake or to be part of a study, to be a participant. Over 100 people died, many suffering from the effects of syphilis, blindness and other problems as well. This study was absolutely abysmal and harmful, and it was only stopped in 1972. 1972. And that was just purely because of whistleblowing. These poor black males in Alabama, Tuskegee, might well have informed us about disease progression of syphilis, 
but it was an absolutely unethical study. And here's why when we are doing any research proposals or anything at all, we draw from notes like um, Bouchamp and Childress's Principles of Biomedical Ethics, Beneficence, Non-Malevolence, Informed Consent, Truth, Justice, Veracity. We must ensure that we fulfil our obligations as healthcare professionals. But things do go wrong. So it's really important to make sure that we always question the ethics of any study. And in epidemiology, it's exactly the same. So as nurses, we all want to act with beneficence and non-malevolence, to do good, to do no harm, to ensure that we promote and deliver what's best. Now, the only problem is we all work in a utilitarian healthcare system. And what utilitarian healthcare system means is that we're all there to provide a service which is the best for all. And unfortunately, what that means is it's not the best for certain individuals. So something that might affect a larger community, if you're trying to do a healthcare intervention, might well ignore some of the undisclosed communities or the lesser representative communities. So there are things that stop effective use of some of the findings that we have with as epidemiologists. So it's really, really important to start thinking about what happens, for example, let's look at the NHS. What are the financial constraints to making sure that we can deliver effective health care for each individual? What are the social and economic costs of delivering large scale interventions for populations? Because problematically, epidemiology will offer solutions and tailor-made solutions for a wider community. And that's the problem, because when you aggregate medicine or interventions to wider populations, wider communities, there's always going to be people that are missing out. So if you're going to do anything at all about epidemiology, always think, who are we missing about? Who are we missing out? What are we trying to do? If we are disseminating evidence, who's that evidence best for? And how well can we make sure that we get that voice heard? So we know the epidemiological processes are ones of surveillance, looking around what's going on across communities, analysing, understanding the risk factors, understanding disease profiles, understanding causation and risk. Epidemiology evaluates, so looks at interventions to see whether they work enough. An epidemiological process informs policy. But even if we do know something's going on in communities, we then have a responsibility to make sure that our governments listen, that our governments will detect and organise policies which will help us. And that's your role as nurses. And that's your role as nursing epidemiology, bud budding epidemiologists. We must ensure that we inform policy and that we use effective evidence and information which will inform policy. And for that, we draw from our clinical judgment. What do you see on the wards? What do you see in the communities? We draw from relevant scientific evidence. What's out there? What information do we know already? But as nurses, we're going to amalgamate those patient values and preferences as well. And identify those people who don't necessarily group into the big aggregated groups of individuals. We're going to identify the smaller communities who really desperately need our help and our interventions. So we've talked about how do we evaluate interventions. Um, epidemiology can have a look at how useful, I guess, our interventions are. You know, what, what do we do? How can we do them? So let's look at vaccination uptake, for example, or medicines, um, how effective they are. The Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, which is another um, site, obviously do look that up, it's really, really important. When we deliver a medication and identify that there's a side effect of that medication, we have yellow cards. And the yellow card scheme is there to be able to import and report to the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency 
on side effects and drug profiles. Now, what the Medicine and Healthcare Regulatory Agency then do is identify signals. So they'll look across that data and go, oh, that particular medication has been prescribed. Lots of people are identifying this as a side effect. Let's amalgamate all of that information and we know what's going on. We know now that we need to change a patient information leaflet to warn the public about a potential adverse effect of medication. So there's lots of types of surveillance that are going on all across the world and in the UK. And it's just about understanding what they are. These next slides are just basic case studies of what's going on in our times, um, what sort of things, how did we look at them? So I implore you just to have a read of the contents. So slide 27, 28, 29, 30 and 31 have no narration but I'm assuming that you can just read through them all because it just identifies how epidemiology was used in SARS COVID-19 to pick up the pandemic, identify patterns of disease, offer means for risk and lowering risk and mitigating risk for reinfections and then to consider potential future pandemics. And this, my penultimate final slide, but the rest are just references, is have a think about what you want. What sorts of conditions are you interested in? How would you investigate them as an epidemiologist? How would you define the person, place, space, the geography? How can epidemiology help you with your understanding of that condition? And it can be anything. It can be diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It can be dementia. It can be a viral illness. How could you use epidemiology to inform your care? And I hope this lecture has been helpful. Um, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to do this face to face, but um, but hopefully I'll do this another time. And you've got these slides for whenever you want to look at them. I hope you found it interesting and I really look forward to looking at your local and global health posters.